So if only Jonathan Bush had more energy, he might be able to accomplish some of these things. So unlike most of the other people who have spoken with you over the last few days, certainly this morning, I don't spend all of my life in healthcare. I sort of um, dabble in it through uh, the International Institute for Analytics. We work with a number of leading healthcare organizations to address how they can become more analytical. And as Jonathan suggested, uh, it's, I think, sometimes quite useful to take a perspective from other industries with regard to how healthcare can, can pull all this off. So, so let me give you my impressions. Fortunately, I have 15 minutes to solve the problem of healthcare integration for you. Uh, maybe I'll finish earlier in 10. It's such an easy issue. Um, I, I know this is the Tedization of the world that talks are, get shorter and shorter. I've decided, by the way, in all of my teaching, all of my courses are now just going to be 15 minutes long. So, um, Okay, so um, it's a kind of a sad situation. In fact, my goal today is to keep you from having to take any depressants after my, after my talk. Um, as I look out across the uh, healthcare um, system, you see individual healthcare provider organizations often not able to talk to each other very effectively. The clinical data and analytics people can't talk to the financial analytics and data people if there are some, and they can't talk to the quality and operations um, analytics and data people. So that's a bit of a problem. Uh, providers often can't talk to other providers. Uh, in the, uh, in the speaker room this morning, John Halamka said, we finally succeeded in getting data across Huntington Avenue uh, from one uh, uh, Boston-based fa healthcare facility to another. So um, it's uh, a, a work in progress in that regard. Uh, we obviously have exchanges just getting set up now, but most of them are only at the state level. And if you think about these, um, uh, financial networks, for example, that Jonathan referred to. Imagine what it would be like if you could only get cash within Massachusetts, or if you could only wire money from maybe Massachusetts to Connecticut. That's kind of the, the level at which we are now, and uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, whose idea it was to create exchanges at the state level, but it's nice that there appear to be some uh, complementary efforts to uh, be at least more national about it. Uh, one might argue that there should be uh, an international standard, but that seems unlikely unless we are taken over by aliens anytime soon. Uh, uh, if you look outside of providers, they typically don't talk much to payers. Uh, in part for reasons of historical distrust. Uh, life sciences firms don't talk to any of these people. Uh, you know, the, um, they have some of the same internal fragmentation issues. Pharma and PBM firms, not so much either. Uh, it would be nice, I guess, if all of these uh, uh, connected health, quantified self devices started talking to our providers and our payers and so on, but, but that's a long way down the road. Um, and, you know, Certainly, it's if you look at what are the fundamental requirements for doing analytics successfully within other industries and organizations, number one has to be data integration. If you want to do analytics on your customer, you have to get as much data as you can about the various interactions that your customer has with your organization and pull them together and start to understand them. And we're, we're fundamentally lacking that in healthcare. Um, uh, there are a number of problems that this causes. Uh, uh, flat line maybe is the, uh, is the summary term that describes the situation. We can not make care decisions based on cost and treatment effectiveness, uh, which it's clear in, in our um, very expensive healthcare system for not very impressive results, we need to do more of that. We can't get high quality area when you happen to be outside of your local area. Fortunately, nobody gets sick when they cross state lines. That's the good news. No, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting assumption that we make there. Let 
we can't let care providers see how they relate to others in key behaviors. Um, and it turns out what drives behavior change in, uh, in providers is the ability to see how they compare to other people on key financial measures, for example. When Cleveland Clinic started to um, look at the use and the cost of blood, for example, in its um, treatment facilities and its care processes, it started to make that information transparent to providers, um, physicians and nurses, who started to say, gee, I'm using a lot more blood than anybody else in the OR. Uh, maybe I can find some ways to cut down on that, but it's pretty, pretty rare. We can't track care across a continuum of providers if we're discharged to um, some f form of therapy center or home uh, treatment or something like that, you know, too, too bad. We can't make educated decisions about which providers to choose in the first place. I mean, all of these things are starting to get a little bit better, but um, still not very good. We can't determine quickly whether drugs and devices are working working or not, so we end up having these uh, very expensive and damaging, uh, effectively, recalls of these devices uh, in, uh, after a, a number of years of sort of post-market surveillance. Um, and overall, we can't reduce the cost or improve the effectiveness of the, of the system without this sort of integration. So, you know, I spend my life working with organizations on analytics and trying to get them to move from the bottom of this chart to the top. The bottom is descriptive analytics, reports. Uh, healthcare is mostly about reports now. Uh, descriptive analytics, um, and in many cases, the lowest end of descriptive analytics with standard reports. Um, there have been some exceptions. You know, um, John Glasser, when he was CIO at Partners here in Boston, was very good about establishing a series of alerts for physicians when they should start paying attention to patient data because they know, uh, uh, we know they're all overburdened and, and lacking in attention. But what we really want to do is to get above the line. We want to get into predictive and prescriptive analytics. Predictive analytics are analytics that tell you what is going to happen, of course, and prescriptive analytics are analytics that tell you what to do. Basically, your chance of getting this disease is such and such, so here are the steps that you should take to avoid it. And I think it's probably fair to say that healthcare is behind every other industry in terms of moving from the, from the blue types of analytics to the, to the red. Uh, so, what do we do about this in, in the five minutes or so that I have left? Um, I have observed that in the organizations where someone is in charge of data and analytics across all data types, it, things tend to work better. Now, I think uh, generally a good thing within provider organizations over the last few years that, we, that we've had these CMIO, Chief Medical Informatics Officer jobs, but typically that's only for clinical data and analytics. Um, so um, if you're interested in comparing uh, uh, treatment to cost, then you obviously have to get financial issues involved. If you're interested in looking at how it all relates to quality, you have to get operational data involved. So there are um, a few cases. Uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center just established a chief analytics officer that looks over these um, different types of data and analytics. Uh, uh, Mike Gustafson at the Brigham. Blackford Middleton, unfortunately, we just lost him in Boston to Vanderbilt, but he says um, as CMIO at Vanderbilt, his goal is not to just deal with clinical data, but to do uh, these other types as well. Um, we clearly have to free the data from the EMRs. I was talking recently recently with a uh, large, mostly West Coast-based uh, provider, payer, combined organization, you probably can figure out who they are, who has uh, 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 spent a massive amount of money in the $3 billion range to put in an EMR system, and they can't get their data out. Um, of any type, clinical, financial, operational, or otherwise. So um, it uh, makes it extremely difficult if you have these closed EMRs to 
to um, start to have any kind of integration within single providers. And then there are the usual integration issues, uh, not having a common de definition of patient across the organization, uh, common patient identifiers lacking, agreement on retention periods and access, and so on. Uh, people talk about ownership. I think it's an unhelpful term. Stewardship is much more likely, but we have to assign responsibility for it. Um, we always thought that we could address these issues through complex data architectures. It turns out data arguing among senior executives is a more useful approach than a highly complex uh, uh, inf information engineering oriented data model. If we're going to look across providers, uh, you know, I think in the short run we have to uh, think about exchanges in this regard, but we've underfunded exchanges. They only get about 10% of the ERA funding, the, you know, a lot going to EMRs, not so much going to how do you get um, data across EMRs. Uh, certainly um, various EMR standards and uh, the idea of meaningful use, particularly stage two, is helping in this regard, but uh, painfully slow. Day-to-day data, data integration is still really tough. If you talk to anybody who has managed an exchange, like Mickey Tripathi here in Massachusetts, um, you, you hear substantial data gaps across institutions, different EMRs uh, collecting different things. Uh, aligning the information is not a data issue, it's a process redesign issue in many cases, which sort of raises the whole ante in terms of organizational change. Uh, 90% of patient interactions occur in medical practices of nine physicians or less, and of course, those are the last ones to, to implement EMR. So it's um, a, a slow, painful process, no matter what we seem to do in this regard. Across the system, between payers, providers, and life sciences organizations, uh, you know, each one of those firms, you know, I talk often to uh, analytical people in pharmaceutical com companies, and the uh, the R&D analytics people don't talk to the commercial analytics people and they don't talk to the health economics people and, and it's uh, as bad as it is in provider organizations. Uh, you do have an interesting trend where payers are buying exchange vendors, are buying data companies like Humedica, um, and I, if I had to pick one sector that was more likely to drive integration than any other, I think it's probably going to be the, the payers. It also appears to be easier to gather data from outside the system than work within it. And then, uh, like Humedica, you may be bought uh, by one of the, the payers. I remember talking to Paul Bleicher, and I, he, he described what Humedica was doing, and I said, well, that sounds fantastic. I would think the payers would be fantastically interested. And he said, well, I'm sorry, we can't give it to them because if we do, the um, providers won't give us the data in the first place because they don't trust the payers. And then a few weeks later, they were bought by United Healthcare. So it'll, it'll be very interesting to see how that all works out, I think. Um, so there are a few points of integration light. As I said, I don't want to depress you too much. Uh, meaningful use, I think, is helping. ACO is helping integrate across clinical and financial measures and operational. Someday for HIEs, you have some organizations like Cleveland Clinic and Inner Mountain that already have cost uh, considerations built into their provider or into their intelligent provider order entry systems. And I think that's one of the reasons why these organizations have been so fantastically successful, get mentioned by every presidential candidate in the debate, because they have systems that had this integ integration from the beginning. You have organizations like the Care Connectivity uh, Consortium, which is five institutions, Kaiser, Mayo, Intermountain, uh, a couple of others, you know, the usual suspects in many cases saying, we're not gonna wait for this to happen, we're gonna start sharing data with with each other, and they've started to um, collaborate with another organization, uh, Health e Ways, Health e Ways, doing uh, a national exchange approach. I thought Humatica and Optum Labs is a very interesting model, pulling together tons of data on on tens of millions of lives to start doing analysis on it. Uh, Blue Shield of California has this program they call POET, which uh, interfaces uh, electronically, shares data with about uh, 50 different provider organizations. It's been quite successful at lowering everybody's cost. And then you have Blue Health Intelligence, this organization founded by a number of Blue Cross organizations to share data and analyze it. 
You know, the interesting thing about BHI is it took so long to sort of get and standardize the data that many of the blues became dissatisfied and sort of spun it out into a separate organization. I think they're now in their uh, seventh or eighth year and they're really just starting to analyze the data in earnest after a long period of just pulling it together. Um, so where do we go from here? I, you know, it's a, it's a grand experiment that we're in now. All of the other networks we're talking about, the financial networks and so on, were developed uh, by much more centralized kind of activity. You know, federated at least, but centralized. You look at Suris and Swift and Fedwire and all these sorts of things, they were not developed through ecosystems and uh, 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 open uh, innovation and Kaggle and so on. So, you know, I think that's probably the way to go, but I think we should realize this has never happened in human history before, uh, that we develop uh, data and analytical integration through this uh, approach of letting a thousand flowers bloom and hoping that they'll all connect together. We need to constantly get more predictive and prescriptive. We need to get people dissatisfied with descriptive analytics and show them that there's much more that's possible. We need better data integration tools from vendors. We have great analytics tools, but we don't necessarily have great tools for getting the data integrated in the first place. We need new organizational structures that create you know, chief analytics officers and, and uh, chief data officers and czars of various types to sort of pull this together. And we need to begin acting like a system. I, frankly, I think that Congress is going to solve this problem right after they get around to deciding whether we should pay our bills and finance the government. They're going to address this issue. No, I think they're not. Uh, so we have to do it ourselves. Thank you very much.